Access Entertainment. My name is Rich Palladino. We have another one of our exclusive interviews from New England Fan Fest 7. And I'm here with the one and only Duke, the Dumpster Drozzy. We're going dumpster diving. It sounds like a lot of people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be fun. We're calling it uh, dumpster diving. So all the uh, questions have been uh, given to me from the uh, executives here at All Access Entertainment. And we'll start with the standard question. How did you break into professional wrestling? Uh, I was a fan growing up, obviously. I watched championship wrestling in Florida. Um, I got into, I got really interest, interested in becoming a professional wrestler. WrestleMania 1, uh, Hulk Hogan, Mr. T, Roddy Piper, all in North match. Um, and I trained down in Florida. I started training to become a professional wrestler when I was still in high school. Actually, I was finishing high school. Uh, came out of amateur wrestling in high school. And a uh, guy named Bobby Wales trained me down in Florida. And that's where I broke into the business. I started doing some independence around Florida. Uh, Bobby and those guys took me down for some Caribbean tours in the Bahamas, Jamaica, places like that as well. And that's kind of where I started out. Very cool. So you did the indies, as most of the guys do these days, guys and girls, and you get that first call from the WWE. How did that come about? Well, I actually got them to call me. I made it happen because I was uh, finishing college in 1993, University of Miami, and still working on the side as an independent wrestler, putting together, I was wrestling as the garbage man, Rocco Gibraltar, and I was putting together as much uh, promo tape as I could put together a promotional package and made like 30 copies of it a resume, a tape and all those things and I was getting ready to drive around the country and try to get a job at one of the territories there were still a few territories left anyway mm -hmm. uh, I ended up walking up to Vince McMahon at a convention in Miami he was at a TV executive convention and I handed him one of the it was only the second promotional package I handed out the first one was to George the Animal Steel at a house show, but the second one was to Vince himself, and they called me up, and I was thrilled, to say the least. Um, I still had not moved out of my college, well, it wasn't really a dormitory, but it was a little college apartment, and um, my dad came over, uh, asked me if I knew who J.J. Dillon was, because he had left a message on the phone answering machine at my mom's house, that was the number I left on there. And uh, yeah, I called back feverishly like 20 times because he was at a meeting and the secretary could tell me he was at a meeting. But uh, yeah, they called me up and they brought me in for a tryout uh, at TV tapings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrestled Reno Riggins. He made me look like a million dollars. And uh, the rest was history. They hired me after that point. Did you get to use your original name for your tryout match? You know, I think they only called me, they just called me the garbage man. Got it. Yeah, for the trial match. Now, I had I had the gimmick with the Rocco name tag on it, which uh, I would actually end up using into like the first six months of working for them, but we just covered it up with like an uh, outer shirt. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I wore the old Rocco gimmick at the tryout, and they just called me the garbage man for that. Very cool, very cool. So you had a pretty uh, exciting program with Triple H. What was it like working with Hunter Hearst Helmsley? Well, I mean, I was, I was excited to find out I was working with him. Um, I had kind of gone to them. My contract had just come up. I finished the first two years, and it was about to roll over for a new year, and that point I really wasn't happy so I think to get me to resign they gave me the Hunter deal now I knew Hunter he was already kind of in the click and everything so I knew I wasn't going to win in the end but it was a great opportunity uh, to have a feud with a guy that was a really good worker at the time um, and also I knew I would get at least a paper view out of it so I was really excited to work with them and uh, it was fun. We had a blast. We did a lot of house shows together, kind of putting together a, a really good match and uh, it was fun to work with them. Excellent. 
and uh, keeping things in the family. What was it? What was the uh, your backstage involvement? What was Stephanie and Shane's backstage involvement at that time when you were there? Stephanie, I never even saw her, or if I did, I didn't even know who she was. Uh, Shane was around. He was when I first came in. Shane McMahon was working. One by one, he would work in every different kind of department of the World Wrestling Federation. And the funny thing was, when I got there, he was working in the studio. So he was the one that took me out and drove me around Stanford, Connecticut, shooting all of my promo vignettes when I was first coming to the World Wrestling Federation. Shane was the one standing behind the camera directing the whole thing, and we would go over verbiage and stuff. When I did those promos off the back of the garbage truck and at the dump, it was all Shane McMahon producing that stuff because he was working, like I said, at the studio at that time. But yeah, he worked his way around in different aspects. He was learning all the different aspects of the company at that time. Great. And what was your relationship like with Vince? Well, the fact, I was pretty good at first, I thought it was. And the fact that I walked up to Vince McMahon to get my job in the first place made me believe that I had the right to talk to him anytime I wanted to, which he was always welcoming and willing to talk. Uh, but towards the end, I think it kind of wore out a bit. And uh, it, it, I wore out my welcome, at least, with talking to Vince so much. And uh, he wasn't so, I mean, he was always willing to talk to me, but um, it was just interesting. Towards the end, we would have these meetings, like out in the hallway, the TV tapings. And we'd be standing there, and I'd just be basically airing my grievances. And he would be standing there, and he would have Jerry Briscoe standing right next to him. Like, I don't know if he was his bodyguard or what, but um, it was just interesting towards the end. But I always felt like I had a good relationship with Vince. I felt like I could go directly to Vince and talk to him where a lot of guys were afraid to talk to Vince. Um, it was a company where you would talk to two or three people down the line, agents, road agents, you know, creative type people, and not necessarily talk to Vince McMahon himself, whereas I would just walk right up to Vince and say, can I talk to you, so. Good for you. Uh, a couple stories, a couple questions I want to kind of combine here. Who were your travel partners on the road while you were there? My very first travel partners were Doink and Dink, the clowns, and Luna Vachon together. That was an interesting. Move. I'd say. I didn't ride with them again. <laughs> Not because of Doink and Dink. Luna scared me. Um, but then I rode with Bob Holly and Adam Bomb for quite a while. I ran a few loops with them, but they always seemed really pissed off at the world me, so I kind of moved on from that pretty quick, too. Um, I always made a point to try and ride with as many different people as possible, but later on it would come down, I'd mainly be riding with either Bret Hart or Stone Cold Steve Austin on different loops uh, as time moved on. The executives here at All Access Entertainment want to know what, what were your favorite road stops during these trips. Favorite road stops? Like, what do you mean road stops? Like strip bars? <laughs> They just said favorite road stops, so that could be places to eat or uh, gentlemen's establishments, so whatever. You know, it's funny, Newark, New Jersey, we would always stay at the Holiday Inn Jet Port, but it seemed like every time we flew in to that place, there was like a go-go bar right down the street from the airport, and uh, it was just topless. But they had good food. We'd go in there in the middle of the day, we'd eat in their diner, and then walk next door to the go-go bar. A lot of times, the guys would have a few beers before we went, went to wherever the show was, you know, Madison Square Garden, Madison Coliseum. But that's how we would start a lot of tours in Newark, New Jersey. We would start at the go-go bar, whatever it was called, and then meander around the rest of the loop. But yeah, that was a really fun place to go. Um, you know, going overseas was always great. Man, Germany. Fans were crazy. It was fun, you know. During a downtime in the United States, it was always fun to go to Europe. So, how about the craziest road story from your travels? Well, I, I was alluding to one before with Luna Vachon on like my first road trip. My first road trip, we did a loop in Canada, a 
of smaller towns. And uh, we were in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Halifax. And Dwayne and Dink stayed in a room. And I made the mistake of rooming with Luna. And next door, there was apparently a party of college kids going on. They were drinking and having a good time and making too much noise for Luna. And she got pissed off and crawled out the back sliding glass door of the hotel room. We were at bed breakfast. And she crawled across the second floor balcony and went into the back of their room and started screaming at them and smashed a bottle into the girl's, some college girl's head. So, <laughs> then she crawled back over like nothing happened. And I'm curled up in the fetal position crying, going, please God, <laughs> what's gonna happen next? So, I knew, I knew the police, I knew the police were coming. And apparently, like right before the police got there, apparently some guy was going to their party showed up. He was drunk and knocked on our door by accident. And when I opened the door, he jokingly took a swing at me, thinking I was some of his friends or something. And he didn't really even hit me, but I had a big bruise on my arm from earlier in the day when I wrestled Bastion Booger. We wrestled some match. I don't know what happened, but I got a bruise on my arm. So. When the police finally came, I told them this guy attacked me. So we had two offsetting stories. The guy attacking me, the drunk college boy, attacking me, and then Luna attacking the girl, smashing her head with a bottle. So they took everybody down to the jail. And one of my first experiences in the World Wrestling Federation was talking Luna, Bashan, out of getting arrested with the Halifax Police Department. But it worked. Amazing. And like I said, I never wrote with them again. <laughs> I can see why. Uh, who were the agents during your time there? Um, there was a lot of road agents. Uh, you know, Chief J. Strongbow, George Animal Steel, Tony Maria, Jack Lanza, Rene Goulet, uh, Dave Hebner was an agent. Um, gosh, who else? I know there's more. <laughs> Were there any that you were more closely associated with than others? I always liked Tony Maria. He was always good to me. Jack Lanza was cool with me. George Yale Steele, he was, we didn't kind of get along at first, uh, but I realized what he was doing. He was, he wanted to make sure I respected the business. Um, did not get along with Chief J. Strombo at all. When I first met Chief J. Strongbow, it was at a TV taping. And I was supposed to wrestle uh, an enhancement uh, talent. I don't remember what his name was. But Chief, who was rather rotund at that time, he was really heavy, <laughs> um, was sitting there kind of barking orders at people. And, and he called me over and started talking to me. He goes, oh, you're wrestling so-and-so. And the guy wasn't there. So I said, Chief, I'll go get him. And for some reason, he took that as like me being cocky and disrespectful. And basically, can we cuss on this thing? I don't see why not. He said, don't you fucking tell me what the fuck you're going to do or who you're going to get. He started screaming at me. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I started begging off. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, no, you misunderstood. And from that point on, for the entire time I was there, better than what, two and a half years, Chief J. Strongbow hated my guts. And I would constantly say, you misunderstood uh, where I was coming from. Uh, I meant no disrespect. I felt like I was always apologizing. Yeah. Always apologizing to him, but so he was difficult to work with. But for the most part, everybody else was cool uh, to me. He was just really nasty. Uh, what were the backstage clicks like at that point? Of course, we know the click, but were there any other little faction back there? The click had just really formed. Um, they were a pretty strong group. At that time, it was uh, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Shawn Michaels, uh, X Pac, who was 123 Kid at that time. That was the main group then. And, um, I remember, I 
always say, I thought it was one of two people that started using the term click. It was either Lex Luger or Adam Baum. I remember hearing Adam Baum say it in the rental car when I was riding with him in Bob Holly. But I also remember Lex Luger using the term click in the locker room. In fact, at WrestleMania, at WrestleMania 11, he, uh, well, I was already kind of a smart ass. So let's just put it this way. And at WrestleMania 11, it seemed like the click just took over the whole card. So I came in the locker room singing, whoa, whoa, click a mania. <laughs> I just kept saying, you know, the, the theme song. Yeah. yeah. Called it Click a Mania. And Lex goes, sing it again, dude, sing it again. He was like, he didn't think I'd sing it in front of them. And I started singing it in front of the click. They were just sitting around looking at me, like, who is this dude? Who does he think he is? And, uh, I, but I didn't, I really didn't care. But yeah, Lex Luger and, and Adam Long started using that term. But that was the main group. They had power. And you had guys like Brent the Hitman Hart who were untouchable. Undertaker, those guys were pretty much on their own, could work with anybody, but they were untouchable. Um, BSK, that really didn't start to kind of come together until later uh, with Yokozuna, the Hawk Farmer, the Undertaker, those guys. Um, Kama, who would later become the Godfather, they kind of, Rikishi, they all started that BSK group. But that was the main groups, but the click was always the most powerful. Got it. Um, how about an Owen Hart story? Owen? Yes. Owen Hart. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think of one that I've told him so many times, but one of, one of my first introductions to Owen Hart um, was when I first started with the company and I, we were in a hotel somewhere. We, we had like two hours before we had to be on a flight going somewhere else. And my phone started ringing at like 2 a.m. And the voice on the other end was just kept saying, this is Domino's Pizza. We got a special running with your hotel, uh, special on two pizzas. If I don't get one free or something like that. And I was just like, what is going on? I don't want any pizza. I'm going to call back. Said, Sir, don't be rude to me. I've got a family to feed. And he kept, he kept going on and on and on. And I swear I picked up the phone probably two or three times. Kept calling back and I had these conversations with him. I mean, it was Owen Hart, of course, um, but to add insult to injury, he taped the whole thing on, like, he put a telephone voice recorder machine on the road and hooked it to his telephone in the hotel room so he could record the whole thing. And not only did he record me, but he re recorded himself calling a bunch of other people's rooms who weren't wrestlers doing the same thing, and he played it for us in the locker room the next day. Um, but Owen was always doing stuff like that, uh, just funny stuff, um, you know, locker room stuff, ribs like that. Harmless stuff, always funny, always had a good time, so. At someone else's expense. At someone else's expense. So take us through with uh, the 2001 Gimmick Battle Royal, full day. How, how, what was that day like? being back there for the, uh, for the Battle Royal. I've often talked about the fact that I was in no shape to be in any kind of wrestling match at that point. Uh, I had come back and uh, it was 2000, I believe, right? Yeah. 2001. WrestleMania, yeah, WrestleMania. And uh, I was just really bad off. I had been using drugs and stuff for a long time at that point. I was out of business for a while. And just kind of on a fluke, somebody told me they were having this gimmick battle royal, so I called Bruce Pritchard. And they brought me in for it. Um, I was really kind of embarrassed and didn't want to see anybody or talk to anybody, so I kind of stayed away from most people mm -hmm. during the whole process. I remember going to Fan Fest and just kind of staying off to the side and not really wanting to talk to anybody. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was a rush walking out there in front of 65,000 people in that Astrodome. That was something I had never experienced that many people. Because remember, before that, when I was there during the uh, new generation era, there was not houses like that. So um, it was definitely insane. Uh, and it was funny in the rain, you know, all these old guys goofing off, Nikolai Volkov, the Iron Sheik, and uh, 
all them. Bruce Pritchard was in there, his brother Love. Jim Cornette was in the ring. I just basically sat back laughing at everything these guys were doing. But it was a fun experience uh, to be in a WrestleMania. I was glad I got to do that and go out in front of that huge crowd. But like I said, I was kind of in no shape to be there, but you know, it is what it is. Excellent. Uh, would you have enjoyed the rumored heel run in WWF, WWE? I would have loved it. Um, I was begging them. And, and they were going to do it, whether it was with Ted DiBiase or just me being a heel on my own. They were going to do it. They just kind of backed off of it for some reason. Um, and that was kind of when I really started to get bitter and angry. That was like the beginning of the end, really. Uh, that's when I really started to complain a lot, trying to have all these meetings with Vince McMahon and complain all the time because they did not go through with the heel run. You know, the original deal with Triple H, when I wrestled Triple H, um, at that point, I was saying, I want to turn heel. I want to change my whole look and persona and make Dudrowski heel. And I remember Jim, it was me, Vince McMahon, and Jim Ross, maybe Bruce Pritchard, we were sitting in a meeting. And Jim Ross uh, jumped on the point that I made about changing my look and persona. He goes, well, if you want to change your look, why don't we cut your hair? And we can use it in a gimmick. We can use it in an angle with Triple H. We can use it. And I just remember sitting there, and I, the words out of my mouth, I said, I don't have a problem with letting him cut my hair to get heat in this angle as long as it pays off for me somehow in the end. Vince McMahon, of course, said, of course, no problem, pal, pal. And um, so I went with it, let him cut my hair on TV, did that whole thing, and I was glad. Um, I wanted to change it, I was looking forward to becoming a heel, and they just never, they never pulled the trigger on it. And then I kind of just fell back to being Duke the Dumpster with short hair and going back to, you know, losing to all the new heels that came in. And it just got frustrating, so. But yeah, I would have loved to be heel, turned heel, I would have loved that. So with that then, uh, what was your favorite match in your career? Whether it be there or anywhere else, favorite match? Well, I always, I've always had different answers for this, actually. It's funny because there's so many way, different ways to look at it. Uh, Jerry the King Lawler was always a blast to work with because I never had to do anything. He did all the work. He had so much heat. And it was just a cheap heat. And I barely had to take any bumps, first of all. He, did, uh, he took all the bumps, too. But it was just a blast to work with him because you didn't have to do much, and the people were right there for every part of it. Um, I, I loved working with Triple H uh, in your house pay-per-view and everything building up to that, uh, working with him on house shows. I feel like I learned a lot working with him. Um, the WrestleMania match, just for the sake it being WrestleMania, the gimmick battle world, and walking out in front of all those people. Those were all highlights um, that I definitely had wrestling. That's great. We're going to uh, wrap things up with the name game, just get some thoughts on some names. But before we do that, uh, any stories about Mr. Perfect? Mr. Perfect was well respected. He was, he wasn't wrestling. He was announcing at that time. He was doing commentary with Vince on Superstars or something. Um, very well respected. You could, um, you could tell the people that were in the clique really respected Kurt. Um, and of course his work always spoke for itself. Uh, he was always giving really good advice to people about the business. Uh, but he was also a river, uh, devious. River, he would he would start things between two other wrestlers, and it would be like he wasn't even involved. But he started the whole thing anyway to begin with. Like I believe, from what I heard, 
he was the catalyst in making that fight happen between uh, the British Bulldog, the Dynamite Kid, and uh, uh, Jacques. Rougeau? Yeah, Jacques Rougeau. I heard he was in the middle of that. And he would do stuff like that all the time. He would tell one guy, this guy was saying this, or this guy was saying that. And he would wind people up and get them so angry. He would just sit back and enjoy it with a smile on his face. But uh, he was a very funny guy, great worker. He gave great advice, but you had to be very careful around who and watching the ribs. All right, that's great. Let's uh, go into the name game. Just uh, got a list of names here and just give us some initial thoughts and that's reactions. Right, you can bury people. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, number one, Yokozuna. Well respected. Uh, I, I love Yokozuna, man. He was a trip. He used to always say, go make me some food. He wanted, it was always wanted McDonald's or Chinese food. But uh, he was a great guy. Um, he tried to come off like a bully and, and push people around, but the reality was he was, he was a good-hearted person. Um, very respected and very respectful um, of other people and of the business. Um, but yeah, he was a great guy. I, I told the story about the time he shattered the toilet in the wrestling building. I can't remember what building it was. I think it was in California, though, but he was, we were in a small lock room, and he was, he was on the toilet, and he, he was there for a while, and that lock room was smelling bad. And I just remember we were being somebody. I was putting together a match with somebody, and I just heard this horrendous noise. I thought it was an earthquake. It was this crumbling, crushing noise. And all I remember is Yokozuna, his feet slipping out from under him. He screamed, and then he started laughing, and the toilet crumbled, crumbled underneath him. And then this big wave of water and crap came rolling across the locker room floor. And everybody just grabbed their bags and ran. Like Godzilla was coming or something. Everybody just ran. But yeah, that was the story I always remembered fondly about Yokozuna. My God, I never in the toilet. Amazing. How about Mantar? I love Mantar. I love wrestling. Um, great worker. Uh, very underrated. You hear that a lot these days. But um, he was a great worker. He was great to work with in the ring. I always told the story about how I was wrestling him when they brought in Dick Murdoch. I don't remember, it was 95 Royal Rumble or something. I think it was 95. Or and I was wrestling house shows with Mantar. And we had this spot we would do every night where I would do something and come off the ropes and he would kick me with the knee to the gut. And I would do the front forward flip, you know, because he gave me a knee to the gut. And on this particular night, we did the same match we were doing night after night after night. And the same spot came up. I came flying off the ropes, no knee to the stomach, but I took the bump anyway. And I caught hell from Dick Murdoch at the bar that night. <laughs> and I had never met the guy. He goes, what the hell kind of bullshit move was that? I just, I just remember being crushed. This idol of mine was just completely destroying me in the bar. And I said, I think that's exactly what it was—a piece of shit, bullshit move. I'm sorry, but that was one of my fond memories with Mantar. Mike Halleck, great dude. Uh, his gimmick gets run through the gutter by people nowadays, just like mine does. He was a great worker. How about the goon? Interesting story about the goon. Wild Bill Irwin. You know, I when I was coming up in the ranks of wrestling through the independent scene, I, I would watch the Road Warriors, and I never, I, I always watched the old AWA matches between the Road Warriors and the Long Riders. Uh, Wild Bill Irwin and Hog Irwin, his brother Scott. Yes, yeah, Scott. Um, anyway, when I wrestled, when they brought in Wild Bill Irwin, before they made him Goon, 
I wrestled a match with him, and I think this is on YouTube. And it was really strange to me because I was wanting to become a heel. I was wanting them to turn me loose and let me hit people with the garbage can and do more like hardcore type stuff. And they wouldn't let me do anything. They wouldn't let me do it. They wouldn't let me do it. And then this one time I had a match with Wild Bill Irwin, just out of the blue. I think it was like Jerry Briscoe or somebody, one of the agents came up to me and they, he said, they want you to go ahead and hit him with the garbage can after the match. So me and Wild Bill Irwin wrestled and at the end of the match, we worked at him or outside the ring and came up and I hit him with the garbage can. Um, unbeknownst to me, apparently, it split him open and he had to get like 10 staples in the top of his head. Now, I had never split anybody with a garbage can before that. Um, it's really difficult actually to do. Uh, you gotta hit him with the seam that comes down the side of it. There's a seam, and if you hit him with that seam, it'd be cut like a razor blade into him. But I, I'm sure I didn't hit him with that. But he was split open, and I always thought it was interesting. And I thought the conspiracy theory in my head was somebody didn't want me to ever hit anybody with a can again, so maybe somebody told him to juice himself when I hit him, so Vince would never let me use the can again. But that's all just conspiracy theory, of course. <laughs> but it was interesting, all of a sudden, out of the blue, one of these agents comes up and says, they want you to hit him with a can. And I did, and he bled all over the place. I felt bad, I gave him my draw that night. But yeah, that's Wild Bill Irwin. Great wrestler, though. I always respected him. I always loved watching him when I was coming up. How about the wrestling plumber, T.L. Hopper? My very last match, at least that's the way I remember it, in the WWF, I was, my spirit was broken. I was tired of being there. I was just angry. It didn't matter what they threw at me anymore. I was like, whatever. You're gonna make me lose to this guy, lose to that guy. So I was thinking everybody's finishes and just getting squashed. And I just remember T.L. Hopper um, coming up to me before the match. We were talking over the match. And he goes, would it be okay with you if I put the plunger on your face afterwards? And I said, you know what, who gives a shit, man, go ahead. I don't care. And sure enough, he did it. And you know, he said he was going to. And I really didn't care, but a lot of people were talking about that afterwards. <laughs> I can't believe you let him put that plunger on your face. It's just gimmick. I'm putting him over, right? Might as well put him over 100%. So by that point, I was cracked, and I was ready to go. And th that was basically the end. Got it. How about Alex the Pug Porto? You know, I, he came in right after I left. So I did not work with him there in the WWF. Um, I talked to him a few times later on down the road. Uh, he, he seems like a great guy to me. He was a good worker, a uh, very solid worker, I thought. But yeah, we were not there at the same time. Okay. How about Thurman Sparky Plug? Bob Holly. Yes. I love me some Bob Holly. Let me tell you. I, right with Bob Holly and Adam Bob in the beginning, there were some times when Bob Holly wanted to kill me because I used to just fuck with him endlessly. Um, we had an argument at one point where I said something to him about his, uh, what was it? We were talking shit to each other, and he came back with, well, at least I'm not embarrassed to take my shirt off in public. Which, he had me there. I was, I was chubby when I started, and I wasn't going to take my shirt off. But I came back with, yeah, but you'll never be tall. And you could see the redness in his face starting to build, and the veins in his neck started to protrude. And he said something else said, well, at least I can work. And I said, yeah, but you're bald. What are you going to do, join hair club for men? He got even more. And this whole time, Adam Mock driving the car, just laughing. Bob was getting pissed. And Bob just looked at me. And for some reason, the 
King Gray just finished eating. He had a fork in his hand. He looked at me and he goes, I will stab you in the fucking neck with this fork. And I just, I laughed it off, but I think he was serious. I laughed it off, but I think he was serious. But uh, I used to mess with him endlessly. Now, later on, me and Bob hooked up and started lifting weights together, and that's when I got into really good shape. The best shape of my life, certainly in the World Wrestling Federation. I was training with Bob Holly two and a half hours a day. Never trained with anybody like that ever again. Uh, he taught me a lot in the weight room. Uh, he trained like an animal, I will say that. And I always appreciate that. Awesome. How about uh, men on a mission? Uh, fuck with that. I rode with them at one time. <laughs> Man, I used to fuck with them too. At least Mabel. I really messed with Mabel because I just did. I remember one time in a parking lot, he, I had him so furious that he decided he wanted to fight me. The only problem was he couldn't catch me. So I just ran around in circles in the parking lot while Mabel from Men on a Mission tried to catch me. And Oscar just sat there shaking his head. Um, but I never rode with him again after that. Just because, again, I would fuck with him ruthlessly. And so I was just trying to get people to crack on the road. I was good at that. And he cracked. He wanted to kill me. Um, but yeah, he couldn't catch me, so. <laughs> it didn't matter. You talked about these two a little bit earlier. Uh, Doink and Dink. Uh, Ray Apollo, the first guy I rode with. Yeah, Doink and Dink. Uh, I, I'll never forget. I, the first trips, I brought my metal garbage can on the road with me on the plane, taped together, and put it through baggage claim. And I just remember walking out with this Suitcase, a suitcase in one hand and a taped up garbage can in the other hand and Ray Apollo, the clown at that time, just started laughing and he asked me if that was my Halliburton briefcase. <laughs> the trash can Halliburton, he called it, and uh, he just laughed at me while I tried to get a fine room for it in the trunk of the rental Ford Taurus we were driving in. But uh, Ray was always cool. All business, you know, um, Dink, Tiger Jackson was always funny. Um, I told the story again, it was with Luna where some drunk in a Canadian town uh, walked up to Luna and asked her for drugs outside of a hotel when we first got there. And I just remember me, me, Ray, and, and me, Doink, and Dink were rooming together at this point. And we were setting up a room, had two beds, and we were setting up a cot. And Tiger Jackson, Dink, came running furiously into the room, screaming. And he used to call Doink, Papa. He goes, Papa, Papa, Luna, she is killing a man. Luna was, so we run out the door, we look down in front of the hotel office, and Luna is standing over the sky, laying on the ground. She had just knocked him almost knocked him out, punched him, knocked him on the ground. She goes, get the fuck away from me, you son of a bitch. And uh, like I said, that was my first experience with Luna and the clowns. Yeah. And I didn't ride with him again after that, but yes. Great Luna stories. How about uh, the late Paul Bearer? I love Paul Bearer. Um, oh, yeah. He's actually, oh, I used to imitate him. All day, every day, to the point that it was ad nauseum. The poor ways would get sick of it. Um, him and Yokozuna, the hounds of hell are paying for your soul. I would do Undertaker promos. Oh yes, with Paul Bear and God, the boys hated it. They got so sick of it. It was funny the first two or three times, but um, I love Paul Bear. He was he was always cool. Um, he always laughed at my jokes, and that was saying something. If you laughed at my jokes, I liked you. And he always laughed at my jokes. Uh, we always got along well. How about old Waylon Mercy? Waylon Mercy, Danny Spivey came in. Uh, that was towards the end of my run. Um, you know, I didn't. I never worked with him. 
I could tell he was hurt. And I remember one night he was showing us his knee in the bar, and fresh scars from knee surgery. And uh, he was just, uh, he was in no condition to really wrestle, but they brought him in. Real cool guy, uh, nice guy. Uh, he did not last long. He ended up going home because he realized real fast how bad the payoffs were at that time in the WWF. And he was like, no way. He just went home one day. But he was a nice guy. He was cool. All right. How about Chad Fortune and Eric Watts, Techno Team 2000? Wow. I, I did not make this list, by the way. But these Techno are Team 2000. I, I know Eric Watts. What was the other guy's name again? Chad Fortune. Chad Fortune. That guy was really green when he came in. Um, I don't think he even had any matches. He may have had one or two matches before they brought him into the World Wrestling Federation. And you could tell by the way he worked, he was green. Um, and I'm sure he'll admit that. And on top of that, just trying to develop the concept of what Techno Team 2000 should have been, they were trying to figure that out too. Um, were they supposed to have like robots or what were they supposed to do? They were having trouble figuring that out. So it was kind of one of those deals that was doomed from the start. It just did not work. It did not work at all. I think they may have sent them to Memphis at some point to try and develop them, but it didn't work. Um, nice guy. I know Eric Watts, they, I think they brought him in about the time when Bill Watts came in. He was going to take over, I guess, booking to some extent. <coughs> But that didn't last long because obviously he didn't get along with Kevin Nash and the click. Um, I will say Bill Watts came in and, and took a look at me as a heel on a TV match. One, There's one WWF match where you can see me wrestle as a heel. I actually turned heel during the match against Marty Jannetty. And um, that was Bill Watts. He asked me to do that. But yeah, after he left, I think after Bill Watts left, Eric's days were numbered and also to that's where Techno Team 2000 probably ended up going off into the sunset. How about Crush? I like Brian. Uh, Brian Adams, he was, he, was, he was a good guy. I remember this one funny story. He probably did not remember it afterwards, but when I went in for my tryout, uh, of course, the boys all get dressed in a particular locker room. And I just remember this locker room, whether it was Grant, Pennsylvania, or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or something. It was a small locker room, and there weren't many chairs. Well, I had gotten there early enough, I had a chair. Um, so I set up my stuff in a corner with a chair, and, um, you know, was getting ready for the days, whatever, the matches I was going to be in, or whatever, wrestling Reno Regans. I, I, Pretty sure it was during my trial. And during the course of the afternoon, for some reason, Crush, Brian Adams, came in and decided to put his stuff on my chair. Now, it wasn't a power move, and he certainly wasn't bullying me. He never even spoke to me about it. Um, but I felt like, now that was my chair, my stuff was on it and around it. So what am I going to do in this situation? So I took his stuff and moved it. <laughs> and I'll never forget, he never said a word about it, but he came in and the look he gave me was like, what? Because I was sitting in the chair getting dressed. And he looked at me just like, did this kid just come in here and move my shit? <laughs> but he didn't say it. He didn't say anything. You know, and he was real cool. He was a cool guy, but he, ended up leaving just shortly after I got there. Uh, I, matter of fact, I was supposed to wrestle him on some shows in Canada, and he just ended up never making those shows, and I ended up wrestling Bastion Booger to begin with. But, uh, and then he was just gone after that for a while. All right, we just got a few left here. How about any memories of Hakushi? Nice guy, very respectful, <laughs> quiet, didn't speak the language very well. Um, he, he was a very respectful guy, though. Um, I, I always respected him uh, and what he could do in the ring. 
I don't think that he used him anywhere near his ability and his potential. Uh, he had the feud with Bret Hart, and that was good, but he could have done so much more. Um, infamous rib story with Owen Hart, and you've probably heard this one, but Owen Hart was riding with Kakushi, and the announcer at the time, his name was Manny, Manny Diaz, I think. Um, I knew him from Florida. Anyway, they were riding in a rail car. And from time to time, Owen would do strange things. And in this instance, Owen pulled over and picked up a homeless guy to give him a ride. And this guy, it was the sweltering heat of summer. This guy had been out doors for quite a while. He was smelling ripe, to say the least. And they put him in the back seat with Hakushi. And then they rolled up all the windows and locked the windows and turned the heater on full blast in the car. And then I believe, as the story goes, they started playing songs on the radio and Owen tried to start a sing-along with the homeless guy and Hakushi and Manny in the sweltering heat with the added heat from the heater and the car running and the windows locked shut. Um, and I think there might have been a video recording of this too. But yeah, that was an infamous rip on poor Hakushi. And Hakushi just had this little, the hat that he used to wear, you, you can see he was just hiding behind it. Scrunched into the corner of the seat, trying not to touch the homeless guy. So yeah, that was a known heart rip, in case you didn't hear that one. Oh my God, winding down, uh, any combination of the body done as Skip, Chris Candido, Zip, Dr. Tom Pritchard, and of course, Sonny. I always, I always liked him. Uh, they, they ripped Sonny. I remember somebody shitting our food in Germany. I remember that, I was there for that. They almost quit over that. Chris and Sonny almost quit. Uh, for that one. And I think it was the kid that did it. I think he's talked about it. X Pop or one, two, three kid at the time. But um Chris was a great worker. Chris Candido was a great worker, and I think, you know, because of all the stuff that went on with Sonny and Shawn Michaels, he was doomed. Um, you know, his career in the WWF kind of got crapped on because of that. He was, I think he was, it was disrespectful, to say the least. But, um, and then when they put Tom Pritchard with him, I, I didn't, never understood that. I just didn't see Tom Pritchard, but he made it work. That's how good Tom Pritchard is, was and is. Uh, he made it work, but uh, that was interesting. And the thing with Barry Horowitz was great. But uh, yeah, I always, Chris was a great worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had great respect for him. I thought Sonny was kind of annoying, but she did her job well. She got a lot of heat um, outside of the ring and in the locker room. She got a lot of heat too. But sometimes I, I like to say the best heat. If you can get heat among the boys, that's the best heat you can get because then you know you're a hot heel when the boys are pissed off at you. And a lot of the boys were very annoyed with Sonny, so she did her job well. All right, we're gonna wind uh, wind down the name game with the supreme fighting machine, Kama. I never understood that gimmick. You know. um, Charles Wright, very respected, good worker, big dude, strong. I love Charles. Uh, and Godfather was the perfect gimmick, but Kama, I didn't get it. Um, you know, I, I understood MMA at the time was coming into its own, and they wanted to have a crossover, uh, you know, somebody that was doing something related to ultimate fighting type MMA stuff. Um, but it didn't seem to me like it translated very well in professional wrestling. And I just remember I had to wrestle him uh, for a King of the Ring qualifying match, um, and I I didn't think the match went very well, but seeing it on tape late, it was actually a pretty good match with me and Kama, uh, which is a testament to 
him, I would say, his ability to work. He, he was a good worker and a very big, strong guy um, and fun to work with. But um, I just didn't get the comma thing. Like, later on, man, that Godfather gimmick was awesome. That was perfect. Perfect. But yeah, the comma gimmick, I, did. I never got it. All right, so that was our name game. I left one question off only because I didn't want it to conflict with the name game. Uh, but I guess we can wrap with anybody that we didn't talk about, any other favorite people that you got to work with? Uh, let's see, I always enjoyed, well, not necessarily work with so much. I worked a few times with Stone Cold Steve Austin, but uh, more so being fun riding up and down the roads in the car, that was the fun. <laughs> Um, it seemed like we always got a styrofoam cooler at the Circle K or whatever the convenience store was, a bag of ice and a 12 pack of natural light beer for the ride after the show. And we ride up right to the next town or to the hotel drinking beers, laughing our asses off. Um, so yeah, I always enjoyed hanging with him and we've talked about that on his podcast as well a bit. Um, you know, I just always try to have fun. I always try to get along with everybody. Um, even if, you know, people have often talked about the clique and how a lot of people did not like the clique or respect the clique. Um, I always had respect for them because I knew deep down they loved the business. Uh, that was a group of guys that would always sit down and talk about the rest of the business. Not a lot of other people were doing that. A lot of people would sit around and bitch and moan about the push they weren't getting, but they weren't, wouldn't talk about ideas for wrestling. Those guys did that. And um, I've often said, as a group, they were quite arrogant to click, but individually, they were fun to hang out with. I used to enjoy partying with Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, uh, Sean Waltman, even Shawn Michaels. Uh, we had fun. So yeah, I had fun with a lot of guys. I like to party too much, you could say. Um, I was always looking for the party after the show. So uh, yeah, if you want to have fun, find Tooth the Dumpster. You'll have a good time, go to the bar. And that's what I did. I tried to have fun with everybody and get along with everybody. All right, well that's great. I think uh, Fan Fest was a big hit. A lot of people really enjoyed seeing you, enjoyed talking to you. How was your experience here at FanFest 7 as we wrap up? It was great, great. It was great to come to FanFest this year in, in Rhode Island and meet with the fans. Um, heard a lot of great stories, told a lot of great stories. Um, got to meet up with some of the guys I've worked with in the past. Some guys I haven't seen in years. Uh, it was great to see them. Uh, some of the fans that I've never met that I'm friends with, like on social media, um, I've got to meet and talk to, spend some time talking to. So it's been a great experience uh, here at FanFest. Fantastic. So on behalf of all of us here at FanFest, to All Access Entertainment, this is our exclusive interview. This is Dumpster Diving with Duke the Dumpster Drozzy. Dumpster Diving. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you.